So it's great to be here with you all. I was here actually in the spring of last year, so it's good to be back. Um, a, a former student of ours, an alumnus of Metro Baltimore Seminary, has been here a couple of times, Jared Dean. Some of you might have been here when Jared has preached. He was my student in a couple of, of classes. Um, so prior to serving at the seminary, I was actually a pastor for over two decades. Uh, and some of that was down in Georgia, but 16 years of that was at a church that I started in Ellicott City, Maryland, just right up the road from here. Uh, and that's how uh, Pastor Rob and I got to know each other. We were, uh, it was, you were a youth minister a long time ago. Yeah, this was before church planting, and he and I got to know each other, and we spent some time on a, a pastors and wives retreat, and uh, it, was, it was good stuff. So um, today I'll be preaching from the Gospel of John chapter 4. So I invite you to find your way to John chapter 4. If you have a physical Bible, just go ahead and flip there. If you're using an app, go there on the app. Um, I, the words may be up here as well. Uh, just a real quick commercial about the seminary. We are affordable, accessible, and transformational. Total tuition for our Bachelor of Theology degree and our Master of Divinity degree for their three-year programs each. Total tuition is less than $10,000. Yeah, you're not going to find a master's degree cheaper than that. And we do that in a couple of different ways. We have very generous donors. We use churches as our campuses, and they provide the space for us for free. All of our instructors are full-time pastors and biblical counselors, and so they do this on top of their ministry work. It's important to us that we have um, our theology instruction, our Bible interpretation, our pastoral skills being taught by people who are actually currently in ministry, and so you're, you're going to have practitioners uh, serving in that way. We are also accessible. We have two campuses, and as you heard, we're getting ready to start one in Anne Arundel County uh, in August of next year, Lord willing. Um, we have, in addition to those two degrees, we have a one-year certificate in Christian studies. The cool thing about that is if you decide you want to continue on for your master's or your bachelor, it counts as your first year, so that's fantastic. But we have folks who, who do that certificate who say, you know, I'm not necessarily interested in doing a master's, and I'm, I don't feel like I'm supposed to be a pastor per se, but I'm, I'm a Sunday school leader, I'm an elder, I'm a deacon, um, I love Jesus, I'm, I'm a retiree. We have several retirees who just said, I've always wanted to go to seminary, and now I just want to do this and get this one-year certificate. So if you're interested in learning more about that, there's some information back there. I'll be around. That's the end of the commercial. Okay. All right, well, let's go to John chapter 4. I'll pray for us, and then we'll take a look at the text. Father, thank you for this morning. It's beautiful outside. It's definitely fall. We're grateful for that. Lord, you promised to us in your word in Genesis that you would bring the seasons. And so as we see the change of the seasons, it's a reminder of your faithfulness to us. And so, Lord Jesus, I ask now that as I... Uh, preach your word that you would enable me today, Lord, to rightly divide your word. Uh, please give me, um, Lord, just a, a sense of your presence. Give each of us an awareness of your presence. Open all of our hearts to receive your word. Give us eyes to see you and ears to hear you. And give us a will to act on your word. That we would not just be hearers, but doers. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to read several verses, but not at one time. So I'm going to walk us through this text. So we're going to go through it kind of piece by piece. Uh, that way we can, uh, we can move through it this morning. So let's take a look at John chapter 4, the first couple of verses. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, that's referring to John the baptizer, Although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. So Jesus, this is right at the very beginning of his ministry, his disciples are baptizing other disciples. 
And word gets around in the Jewish leadership of the time, in particular, a sect of the Jews called the Pharisees. The Pharisees hear about this. These were the folks who were, in general, very concerned about right uh, obedience to the law of God. And so they're generally just kind of concerned about who's this guy and who are these people and why are they baptizing? Uh, those of you who've read the Gospels may remember they did the same thing with John the baptizer. They sent some people to go and find out about him. And so Jesus uh, moves away from this region and goes back to his hometown region of Galilee. And as he goes, it says in verse 4, he had to pass through Samaria. Here's what's really interesting. This morning when I got up, I left my home on the west side of Baltimore. I live right inside the Beltway. I drove down 95 to get here to College Park. Now, if you know anything about Maryland, okay, so here's Baltimore, here's D.C., straight drive, really simple, really easy. I didn't have to actually deal with 495 that much, which was a huge blessing. Amen, Amen. yes. So the way to get from Judea to Galilee in the north is similar. It's a straight line. Samaria, though, is nowhere in that straight line. It would be like me this morning saying, oh, I have to go to College Park, so I'm going to go to Hagerstown in western Maryland and then come all the way down to College Park. It would add at least two hours to my commute. So in verse 4, what's going on here? Does John, the gospel writer, have no idea about geography? Did Jesus just kind of walk out and say, well, I have no idea where I'm going, even though I lived there for three decades. I have no idea how to get there. Let's go through Samaria. No. Here's what's happening. He had to pass through because God, the Father, had a divine appointment for the Son. And the Holy Spirit moved him there. He had to obey his Father. So, guys, let's go to Samaria. So they go to Samaria, and Jesus gets tired. He rests by Jacob's well near the Samaritan town of Sychar. Jesus was a man. He got tired. His feet hurt. He smelled funky at times. He got sweaty. His clothes had to be washed. He would get blisters just like you and me. He's tired. It's the sixth hour, so we're around noon, and the sun is directly overhead, so it is hot. Jesus was a man. He was a human being, just like you and me, and that means we can talk to him about anything, anything. He knows our condition. Jesus gets tired. Jesus gets thirsty. He sits down and he uses his thirst as a springboard into a gospel conversation. Let's look at verse 7. We read this passage earlier today. Uh, thank you for reading it uh, earlier today. Verse 7, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. John, the gospel writer, not the same John as John the baptizer. There's several Johns uh, in, in the Bible. But John here uh, makes it a point to say Jesus was speaking with a woman of Samaria. And Jesus, when he is talking to this woman of Samaria, makes it a point to say, you don't know the gift of God. Now, if we were in this uh, time period when this was written, and we were Jews, we would hear this and we would say, yes, of course. A woman from Samaria does not know the gift of God. This is for a couple of reasons. First, if we were Jewish men, and by the way, I am a Jewish man. That is my, my uh, ethnicity. So if we were Jewish men in the first century, we would say, oh yes, of course, a woman doesn't know the gift of God because a woman is spiritually deficient. It was commonly said uh, that Jewish men would say, 
we don't need to talk with women because they have nothing important to say. Which, by the way, side note, apologetics class coming up tomorrow night. Here's a little apologetics for you as well. Isn't it interesting that the first people to see the resurrected Christ were women? So we would have said, oh, yes, of course, she doesn't know the gift of God. She's a woman. Secondly, she's a Samaritan. Double whammy. There was a prejudice and hatred between Jesus, or sorry, between the Jews, not Jesus, the Jews and the Samaritans that ran very deep. There's an ethnic prejudice. Here's who the Samaritans are. You may remember in the Old Testament, the kingdom of the 12 tribes of Israel was united under who? King David. King Solomon expanded that kingdom, Solomon the son of David. King Rehoboam, who is the grandson of David, the son of Solomon, inherits the kingdom and is a terrible leader, and there's a civil war that breaks out, and it splits into two kingdoms. In the north, you had Israel with ten tribes, and in the south, you had Judah with two tribes. The kings of David were here in the south, and Jerusalem was the capital. In the north... In Israel, the capital became Samaria. Now, here's what happens. The, Samari- the, the folks up here in Israel look down at Jerusalem and they say, well, they've got Solomon's temple. We need a temple to Yahweh as well. So with all good intentions, they build another temple in Samaria, a rival temple. And then fast forward several hundred years, the Assyrians come in, They wipe out Israel, and they take them into exile. Judah remains. And then about 150 years or so later, Babylon comes in and wipes out Judah. Now, here's the interesting thing that happens. The way the Assyrians worked, they distributed people everywhere. You got conquered, that's the end. You got distributed everywhere. So all of these Jews intermarried with non-Jews all over the ancient Mediterranean world. And then they come back. After Babylon is conquered by Persia, and they move in. Now, the Judah, the folks here in, the, in, in Judah, they go into Babylon. They remained in Babylon. They did not intermarry. Persia conquers Babylon, and they come back. So now you have a few folks here who said, we are ethnically pure Jews. But you in Israel, you intermarried. You're Samaritans. Samaria, Samaritans. Judah, Jew. Do you see the difference? Do you see where these come from? We do get the word Jew from Judah. So now you have an ethnic difference here. You have a religious prejudice as well. You guys up there built a rival temple to worship Yahweh. You're supposed to worship here in Jerusalem. And you had a religious prejudice. The Samaritans only accepted the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That was their Bible. The Jews in the south accepted the Torah, the five books, in addition to the prophets and most of the writings as well. And so here you have all kinds of stuff going on. And so the Jews would have said, of course she doesn't know the gift of God. She's a woman and she's a Samaritan. But is that what Jesus is saying here? Spiritual thirst, that's what he says here. He says, if you knew the gift of God, verse 10, and who it is who's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Spiritual thirst transcends gender, geography, and ethnicity. The temptation for us is to look here and to say, well, boy, those Jews, they were just so prejudiced. But don't we do a similar thing, too, when we in our minds or in our hearts think, well, those people over there, they need the gift of life. And we forget the mirror right in front of us, that we, too, need the gift of life. We all need this gift of life. And Jesus says, I have to give this to you. It's a spiritual thirst you cannot quench on your own. Verse 11. So the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with. The well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. 
But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water again. What is this living water that Jesus offers? It's crucial for us to understand this uh, as we move through this passage. There are four things Jesus says here, and really briefly, we'll, we'll take a look at these. First, in verse 10, the living water is a gift of God, a gift of God. Do you like gifts? Yeah. Yes. Anyone else? I'm glad you like gifts. Some of you do. I'm glad. I like gifts. There's nothing wrong with liking gifts. Christmas season, by the way, is coming up. Just so you know, and I don't know, this might strike some anxiety in some of you, it is 71 sleeps away. So start getting ready for Christmas. It's coming. Christmas season, I love receiving gifts. I am exceptionally blessed in that by God's providence, I was born in the month of June. So I have six months to Christmas and six months to my birthday every year. And a double bonus, my birthday happens to be within the same week usually as Father's Day. So I get bam, bam in June and then I get, you know, Christmas. And of course, since I'm Jewish, I get Hanukkah as well. So I'm just like the gift maven here. It just all comes to me. The gift of God is living water. Jesus says, if you knew who offered it, you would ask for it. Why? Because the gift giver is God, and all that God does is good. If you knew who offered you the gift... Not if you knew what the gift was, but who gives you the gift. Because when you know who gives you the gift, you know it's the best gift. Secondly, living water quenches spiritual thirst. In verse 14, Jesus says, you will never thirst again. I drink water and I get thirsty. I drink water and I get thirsty. I have probably drunk thousands, if not millions, of gallons of water in my life, as have you. When you attempt to quench your spiritual thirst by yourself, you will thirst again. But when you drink the living water that is the gift of God, you will be satisfied. I'm going to hit the pause button here because some of you are thinking... Well, Adam, I, I drink that water, and I'm thirsty. What's wrong? Problem is not the water. It may be. It's possible. It's entirely possible that you've returned to drinking from mud puddles. And you've confused the mud puddle for the deep, everlasting, bubbling up, eternal well. When you're thirsty for meaningful connection and relationship, if you choose to drink from the curated wells of Facebook and Instagram and TikTok, they won't satisfy you. You're going to get thirsty again. If you're thirsty for purpose and adventure and you move to the distracting wells Netflix, a packed calendar, working late into the night, you're going to thirst again. And if you are thirsty for comfort and happiness, and you drink from those very fragile wells of accumulating money and possessions, you will thirst again. Now, a lot of these things are not evil, right? Money in and of itself is not inherently evil. Netflix is great. It's a fun thing to, to do every now and then. Facebook and Instagram and those sorts of things, it's a good way to connect with people you haven't seen in a while. Some of these are morally neutral. Some of them are gray areas. Some of them are actually pretty good things. But none of them is meant to satisfy you. And when you put the full weight of your desire to quench that thirst onto something that was never meant to do it, you're going to crush it, and it's going to crush you. 
So if you're here today and you're not satisfied, ask yourself, have I returned to a false well? Have I returned to something that gives me a little bit, but I have to keep coming back to it? Jesus is the well that does not run dry. You see, the, the crazy thing about these things is that um, you go to them, they, they provide some release, but you have to keep going back, and then you need more and more and more and more and more. It's different with Jesus, because when you go to him and, and he quenches your thirst, you do have to go back to him, don't you? But when he gives you more and more and more, there's a little difference here. It's not this sense of, oh, I have to get this fixed. It's this relational connection. It's a deepening of love, a deepening into the mind of God, a deepening into the heart of God, and into the mission and purpose of God. It's actually exponential. This is what Jesus means about it welling up, and that's the third thing. It is water that's given in abundance. There's no shortage of it. You don't have to rely on your own strength. You don't have to drink from lesser wells. You don't have to control your life. It is welling up inside of you. And the fourth and final thing about it is it's eternal. Verse 14, it is eternal life. It's a relationship with God that begins today and the blessings that come with that today and forevermore. So the main point of my sermon, if you don't get anything else, just here, hey, zone in. Whoop, here we go. You were thinking about the Ravens game. I caught you. Here's what you got to do. Zone in right now. One thing I want you to walk away with, Jesus Christ gives eternal life to all who ask for it and accept it. Jesus Christ gives eternal life to all who ask for it and accept it. So in this gospel conversation, Jesus reveals to this woman her need. She's spiritually thirsty. And the good news for that woman and to all of us today is Jesus Christ gives eternal life, eternal water to all who ask for it and accept it. Now Jesus confronts the woman with truth. Let's take a look at verse 16. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband, and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying you have no husband, for you have had how many husbands? What does it say? Five husbands. The one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Sorry, I needed a Ricola. That's a little commercial there for you. Ricola. <clears throat> I thirst. <laughs> In response to this, this uh, confrontation of truth, the woman responds with a partial truth. I have no husband. What's she doing? She's telling part of a truth so that she can avoid telling the whole truth. I'll give you a little bit so I can avoid telling you everything. I do that. You do that. We all do. We can relate to it. It's kind of like when you take a photo and you're like, I'm going to totally post this. And what do you do with it? Right? You kind of crop it a little bit. You adjust it. Maybe you put a little filter on it. Maybe you kind of blur out some of those wrinkles if you got them. I do. Uh, you kind of do all that stuff and, and, and then you post it. This is me at the soccer game. You know, that's what we do. Curated. That's what she's doing. I'll just crop out a little bit here and there. I'll, I'll brush it up a little bit and then I'll give this to Jesus. He sees the whole picture. And the whole picture of this particular individual's life is that she has made a disaster of marriage and relationships. She can't hide her sinful relationships from Jesus. The same is true for you and me. We can fool others, but Jesus is never fooled. Jesus, when he confronts you about the truth in your life, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. She must face the truth about herself. We must face the truth about ourselves. And she must face the truth about God. Look with me in verse 19. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Well, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. So she's standing apparently on the mountain where the temple was located in Samaria. 
We worshiped here. You worshiped there. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me. The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor on that mountain in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is, is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. It's easier to talk about religion than it is personal responsibility, isn't it? Now, some of you are going to do this apologetics class uh, coming up this week. Listen, it's always easier for people to debate religion with you than it is to take personal responsibility. So at some point in time, you have to move through that fog, right, and figure out, okay, how do I touch the heart now? What is she doing? She's changing the conversation. Let's talk theology, Jesus. Where are we supposed to worship God? His response, God is less concerned about where you worship than who you worship and how you worship. Who you worship is God. How you worship is in spirit. Physical location does not matter. How you worship is in truth. You worship God according to his revelation of himself to us. When you worship God in spirit and truth, it doesn't matter where you are. You can be in an elementary school in College Park. I know some people who do that, by the way. Verse 26, now the woman must confront the truth about Jesus. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Did you see what just happened there? In chapter 4, we got a long way to go through John, right? We've got three full years of ministry. Year one, on a mountain in Samaria, the Christ reveals his identity to a woman of Samaria. The truth is, Jesus is the Christ, and he's come for all peoples, even those we've written off. How will she respond to Jesus? Will she confess the truth about herself and her sin? Will she confess the truth about God who is worshiped in spirit and truth? And will she put her trust in Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God? How about you? Where are you today? What mountain are you standing on? What relationships have you left in the past? Where are you today? Do you thirst? Jesus is confronting you about yourself. He is confronting you about who you believe God is and who you say Jesus is. And in this conversation, this woman has seen her spiritual need. She's thirsty. She's seen the truth. She is a sinner in need of forgiveness. There is a God who is worshiped in spirit and truth, and Jesus is the Christ. And now she must respond. Verse 27. Just then the disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. The woman responds by going into her town and saying, Three simple words, come and see. Come and see. The text invites us for a couple of responses today. And as I close, I want you to consider these three responses. First, maybe you need to respond the way that this woman did by inviting others to come and see Jesus. It is important to invite friends and family and classmates to come and see Aletheia Church. But it is far more important to invite those persons to come and see Jesus. I don't know what to say. 
Do you think she knew what to say? What did she know? This guy just told me my whole relational, you know, uh, relational life here. This guy just told me what I need to know about God, that we're supposed to worship him in spirit and truth. And this guy just revealed to me who he is, the Christ. That's all she knows. That's all you need to know. Come and see. Come see this man who confronted me with my thirst. Come see this man who revealed to me the truth about God. Come and see this man who gave his life and was resurrected from the dead, proving he's more than a man. He is the Son of God, the Christ. What are you waiting for? What would it be like tomorrow to go to school and to say, come and see? Just come and see. Meet me after school. We'll just take a look at Scripture together. Just come and see this Jesus. You've heard about him. You've heard about his people. I know you've got some misinformation, but I just want to show you who he is based on who he says he is. Come and see. Jesus calls his disciples to respond as well. Verse 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, teacher, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Stand with me on this mountain, by this well, in the heat of the day, and look with me and the disciples when Jesus says, look, the harvest is plentiful, And he points to all the people coming out of Sychar to the mountain. This is what's happening here. The people of Jerusalem and Judea have had this focus of God working here with us. And Jesus is moving their heads and saying, and here he is over here. You've been thinking he's here, but now he's over here. What is Jesus saying here? Well, He's inviting his disciples to sow and to reap, specifically to reap something that they haven't sown. Who sowed all the seed for the people of Samaria? Moses. Moses, the Torah, and the prophets, right? It has been sown, and now you get to reap. I want you to notice one thing here in verse 36. Jesus says the one who reaps is receiving wages, gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower, the one who shares the gospel and proclaims it, and the reaper, the one who has that joy of praying that prayer with someone and and baptizing them, may rejoice together. If there is no joy in your faith today, ask yourself, am I actively sowing and reaping? If you lack joy, sow. If you lack joy, reap. Maybe your response, like this woman, is to invite others to come and see Jesus. Maybe your response, like the disciples, is to sow the gospel seed and reap new disciples. Maybe your response is like the Samaritans. Verse 39, many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. That was her gospel proclamation, by the way. He told me all that I ever did. I love it. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Notice their progression. Someone, a friend, has told us about Jesus. We're curious. We've actually heard Jesus' words. Now we're very interested, and now we have come to believe. This is the path 
of salvation. Someone introduces someone else to Jesus. Then Jesus' words begin to uh, be poured out into their life. That's the reading of scripture, either verbally or reading it here. Some, in some way, the words of Jesus are making it into their life. And then the Holy Spirit regenerates the heart and they believe. Maybe like the Samaritans, your response today is to believe. You've heard, you've received, and now it's time to act. You must believe. Maybe it is time to take that step and believe. If that's you today, I know there are spiritual leaders in this church, men and women, who love Jesus and who love you and who would love to talk with you about that. I encourage you, do not leave this elementary school today without first talking with Pastor Rob or a brother or sister here and say, look, it is time for me to believe. I now believe because God has revealed it to me. Jesus Christ gives eternal life to all who ask for it and accept it. So let's invite others to come and see. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for eternal life made available through the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. We ask today that his name would be glorified in the remainder of our time of worship together. Thank you for this church. Thank you for each individual here, brothers and sisters, those who you, you are still wooing into the kingdom, small children as well. Lord, we are so grateful. Thank you, Father, for this community. I ask your blessing upon this church. I ask your provision upon this church. I ask for a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon this church, that each person here would have a vision for College Park to see your kingdom move beyond this church into every house and apartment and dormitory here in College Park. For that to happen, we need your grace. And so we humbly ask this prayer in Jesus' good and holy name. Amen.